Hello, everybody. Um, for those of you that are at home, either just on the opposite day or your full-time virtual, you're going to need to join AP Classroom. So you will want to go to My AP. Well, let me just put that up. Don't say it on there. Okay. If you don't want to go sign in to myapcollegeboard.org, can they read that on the screen? Myapcollegeboard.org. Okay. Then you're going to go to join a course and you want to join AP Chemistry. And then you have to submit a code. So the code, this code right here. So submit that code and then check that, make sure everything's right, and then kind of go from there. Okay? So everybody needs to join AP Classroom. I'm going to start giving some assignments in AP Classroom that are AP style tests. It's just going to be a different way to do some work at home rather than just out of the textbook. All right? So if you have any issues joining AP, especially those of you watching online, uh, just let me know, email me and say, hey, I couldn't get on, or what, what do I need to do, or, or whatever, and I'll walk you through it. All right? Thank God it's Friday. Yesterday's video sucked, okay? So um, I ended up putting the sixth period one out there as well. None of them were very good. I'm hoping that today is going to be better. what we ended up yesterday in the notes. We started off, we were talking about cathode ray tube, and I showed you the videos, and I gave you the links that you couldn't see the video on the screen, that you can go and watch the little videos uh, just on a cathode ray tube. This is also a cathode ray tube. This costs $600 because it's expensive glassware, the, the, the takes a lot to get everything in here, but it's a vacuum on the inside. You can see right here, and this is where they attach the hose and they suck all the air out of it while it's hot. Okay? And that's what J.J. Thompson was able to figure out is that um, they couldn't deflect it with an electric uh, field because the vacuum wasn't good enough. So he was able to get a good vacuum by sucking the air out while the glass was still hot because then the gas molecules didn't stick to the sides and knocked everything off made a move. There's a metal plate right here that's hooked up to that wire. There's a metal plate right here that's hooked up to this wire. Okay? Now we've got a little pinwheel in here. There wasn't this one on the video. The kind of the video, they don't let you buy them anymore. They said, yeah, they said something about they emit x-rays or whatever, but I used them in every other school that I was in. But if you look at this, red is positive, black is negative. Okay, and I turn this on, that pinwheel is going to spin. Pinwheel is going to spin. Okay, now, and you can, I don't know if you can see, but it's kind of glowing. Can you see it glowing right there? If I go A, B, U. We go here. Now you can kind of see the glowing color. So this is actually a couple of things. If it were just normal light, if it was if it was a beam of light, so like we saw the green light that got bent on that video, okay, then it can't be light. Light doesn't get bent by a magnet. This is also more proof that the beam is actually a beam of particles, not just, you know, some x-ray type beam. 
the negative electrode is always called the cathode. So this is a cathode ray because it's emanating or starting from the cathode. Alright? This TV right here is a cathode ray too. This TV actually has three electron beams being shot at it. The screen is the anode. And just like those grow different colors when the electrons hit it, they have three dots on this screen, a series of three dots of blue, red, and green in triangles that go over. And the, the, when you talk about 720, 1080, and all that as far as, that's how many lines of resolution, that's how many lines of dots there are down and across, okay? And so one beam goes and shoots and hits all the blue dots. One beam goes and hits all the green dots, and one goes and hits all the red dots. Together they make a picture. And they do that, and there's like 1080 lines, 1080 lines. And it does that, it skips every line, comes down and goes back and fills in the line. It does it 60 passes, which makes 30 frames. Two passes make a frame. So we have the frequency of 60 cycles per second. You make 30 frames per second. So it's like a moving picture. Your arms here, and then your arms here, your arms here, your arms here, your arms here, your arms here. When you just flip through it, it looks like arms moving. You and I cannot detect the difference from frame to frame to frame to frame to frame. 30 frames a second look like it's continuous because there's a little residual mode, um, image on your brain. They just stay there for a second. And so this is just a fancy cathode ray tube. Now, I can explain how that works, but it's still amazing to me that somehow they can broadcast, the signal can go through, and I can put a little piece of metal up there. Back in my day, we could use a wire coat hanger as an antenna. And somehow those signals would go down, and you would be able to get some kind of picture showing up on there. Okay? That's really quite amazing. The technology. You take, I mean, you take out a cell phone. I dial the number, and it goes to some tower somewhere, picks it up, sends it to a satellite somewhere, sends it to another tower, and finds the phone and talks to it, and I can just talk to the person. It's got to be a little yeah, mind boggling. All right. So the, the electron was the first subatomic particle. Then if there's a negative one, there has to be a positive one. And so it's just assumed that there was a proton in there. And then the electron, uh, the, the neutron wasn't was found until 1932. So 1897 was the electron. And then pretty much the turn of the century, 19, early 1900s, they just said there must be a proton. Really with Rutherford's gold foil experiment with the nucleus, he knew that the mass had to be that proton, that positive thing. Okay. But there, there was unaccounted for mass, and so they, they took till 1932, James Chadwick was able to bombard really um, without the particles, and this stream of neutrons came off. And so um, now we have the three subatomic particles. Now, the big thing is just note protons and neutrons are about the same mass. A neutron is just slightly heavier than a proton. Electron is 10 to the minus 4. 10, it's way, way lighter. So it has mass. But again, if you go and you plug the hair, the hair has mass. But compared to your overall body mass, you didn't really lose weight. You know, we like to think of it, maybe we lost a little bit of weight. But, you know, it's so small. So that's what it is with the electron. So we don't consider the electron into the mass of an atom at all. Just because it's so, you know, so much lighter. All right, so we use what's called the atomic mass scale. They had to make something up because atoms were on the order of 10 to the minus 22 grams. That's not anything that's going to be workable. So they came up with AMU, a very creative name, atomic mass unit, AMU. Okay? You do not, this would give, always be given to you, this conversion, but you just need to know that the AMU is a scale, but it's all going to be relative still. So carbon is 12 protons and neutrons. Uh, hydrogen has one. And so carbon is going to be 12 times heavier on any scale. It's going to be 12 times heavier. So they've made the scale. So hydrogen is one AMU, which is what they made the scale work out to be. 
1 AMU, then carbon is going to be 12 AMU. And they actually use carbon-12 as the base. They said, by definition, carbon-12 is exactly 12.000000000 AMUs. Mm -hmm. Then they just compare everything to it, based on you just set up a ratio. What is the gram ratio? And then you make up your AMU scale, and it just all matches up. Carbon is going to be 12 times heavier than hydrogen. Carbon is 12, oxygen is, is 16, and so Relatively speaking, in terms of grams and AMUs, they're going to be the same ratio. So the AMU scale gives us the mass of a single atom. Now, generally, we don't deal with the mass of a single atom. We deal with a mole of atoms, but the mole is based on carbon-12 as well. So the red number on the periodic table tells you the mass of one atom in AMUs, but it also tells you the mass of one mole of atoms in grams. And that's the one we use a lot, the molar mass. The grams per mole. All right, now, on the West page, this is in the book. Um, if you can go to your textbook online, the whole lot of Chromebooks are fun. There's an article on the mass spectrometer. Now I want you to read this article, but it's not done quite fit. Can you read that? Is that big enough to read? If not, you can go to the page, go to chapter 2, page 52. But we need to read this little article about mass spectrometer.
a quick discussion of this, and we've got to go to the Now, a mass, spe ma a mass spectrometer, obviously, by definition, by the name, what does it measure? Mass. Okay, now, I say that but kind of like sarcastically, facetiously, but on the AP test, they ask a question about a mass spectrometer, and then they'll give you responses dealing with um, electronegativity, oxidation states, you know, bonding or orbitals, and then all of a sudden, and that orbital will say something about, you know, the average weight or the weight of an atom or you know, the percent abundance or something. And so there's only one, I mean, you can answer that question really not knowing hardly anything about the mass spectrometer, just knowing that a mass spectrometer measures mass. Okay? That's real, real high level there. Okay? But you also know how to interpret the peaks. Okay? And so the way the mass spectrometer works, shoot the sample in there, and it puts a charge onto it, and then it goes into this magnetic field, and the lighter it is, the more it's going to get deflected. The heavier it is, the less it's going to get deflected. And so they have a detector over here, and notice that the, the, the 35 got deflected more than the 37. And it just collects. And then it gives you a graph over here of the detector can determine how many how many are hitting it. So it gives you a percent abundance. So there's obviously way more 35 than there is 37. But in a mixture of chlorine, there were only these two peaks, which means those are the only two isotopes of chlorine. Okay? And so it gives us the relative abundance as well as what's present. If we look at one like bromine, okay? So here are the two peaks down here at 79 and 81, okay? Now those two peaks are about the same height, which means about a 50 50 mix of 79 and 81, okay? But bromine is one of our seven diatomic elements. So what are these over here? Compound? Is that what I heard someone say? What is this? I tell you again, you guys all have masks on and I'm old, so we have to speak up. I couldn't even tell who was speaking on that one. The combined weight of the two bromines. And there's a bunch of different possibilities. The two 79s come together for the 158. The 281s come together for the 162. But the majority of the combinations are going to be a mixture of these two. 25% would be these, 25% would be these, but 50% would be one of each, which is going to be the middle one. Okay? So each peak represents a different element, different atom, or a different molecule. Okay? And so we use the mass spectrometer to get the atomic mass and the relative abundance of each element. And it's one of the most commonly used instruments in the industry. Are any of our NCIS fans? Okay. Yes, I can see one. We got Adam Shudo down in the down in the in, in the lab working. She always says a kernel mass spec, um, which is her mass spectrometer, and it's a GC gas chromatograph mass spectrometer hooked together. So the, the gas chromatograph separates the substances. And then it goes directly into the mass spectrometer, which then can help identify what each of the substances are. Each of the substances, what each is. Okay? So mass spectrometer, it's very important. It, 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 you are required to know that for the AP test, what it measures, and being able to interpret a peak like that. Does anybody have any questions on that? We're all good? All right. We're going to take a field trip to the library. We, we covered so much. You're going to take a field trip to the library and go get your textbooks. And these textbooks you can take home and just leave them at home. Because one day we're going to get to use the classroom set that I have here. Alright, you got it all just kind of sitting at home. Alright, yeah, yeah, please. The relative abundance, the position of the peak tells me where we you know how much each piece thing weighs. A mass spectrometer measures mass. Now, so there are two isotopes of bromine 179, 181. Well, how are we going to get the average weight? 
Uh, you're going to add them and, and divide, but it's going to be based upon abundance. Now, on these, since it's about 50 50, what do you think the average is going to be somewhere? 80. You go and you look at bromine right here, and you see that the uh, actual average weight is 79.9, which means that it might be a smidgen more 79 than there is 81. Okay? So when we go and do average atomic weight, we deal with that. Based upon the abundance in nature, I'll turn it off. I'll get it right. Okay, so if we look at a problem such as this one right here, number thirty-nine, is that visible on the screen? Okay. I have three isotopes of magnesium. The relative abundance is 78.99% is magnesium 24, 10% is 25, 11% is 26. So I need to get an average. Well, obviously, which one's the average going to come up closer to? 24. But because we have two that are heavier, it's going to be a little bit heavier than 24. When you go and you look on magnesium on the periodic table, you see there's 24.3 or something. Okay? So, but how do we calculate that? Mass times abundance. Okay? So it's going to be mass times abundance. So this is what we refer to as the isotopic mass, the mass of the individual isotope. And this is going to be an AMUs. Notice that magnesium 24 is about 24 AMUs. It's designed that way. The AMU scale is purposely designed. Carbon-12 is going to be 12 AMUs. It's got six protons, six neutrons. Protons and neutrons are about the same. So it comes out right real close. Magnesium-25 is almost 25. Magnesium-26, almost 26. It's not exact because of a crazy thing that happens. If you take six protons, six neutrons, six electrons, and weigh them all individually, you get a certain mass. But then you mix them all together and make a carbon-12 atom. Six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. Okay? The carbon-12 atom will weigh less than the sum of the individual parts. Okay? Always the atom always weighs less than some of the parts. Where did that where did that mass go? The matter's neither created nor destroyed. Well, what did Einstein find? What's his famous equation? E equals mc squared. So some of that mass is converted into energy, and it's called the nuclear binding energy. It's what holds the nucleus together. Now this is this is just my own mind. You're not going to really need to know this, but I'll just tell you the difference in weight between the individual parts and the actual atom. That difference is called the nuclear mass effect. Okay, the nuclear mass effect is the difference between where the weights individually versus when you put them together. Together is always less. That mass gets converted into energy, and that's the binding energy that holds the nucleus together. Okay, so. Because of that, it doesn't come out exactly 24, but it's really darn close to, you know, 20, this is to, if I round it here, it'd be 23.99, so the three sig figs is, is 24.0. The three sig figs is 25.0. Now, all these problems are almost always going to be given the actual mass, but if you're not, the mass number and the atomic mass are about the same. Now, by definition, they're not the same, but because this AMU scale is derived to make one proton and one neutron equal one AMU, it's about the same. So the three safe things are pretty safe to say that the, whatever the mass number is, is going to be the same as the atomic mass. Mass number is always a whole number. Atomic mass is always going to be a decimal. Do I understand the difference there? So how do we calculate this then? I want to do the actual math. So 
percent, what do I need to do with the decimal? What, what's the 78.99? How am I going to put this in? 0.7899 times 
If I round that off to the nearest whole number, lead is 207.2. I would say, I would guess that lead 207 is the most common isotope of lead. There's probably, a, since it's 207.2, there's probably a 208 or a 209. Something, a small amount that's going to bump the average up just a little bit. Okay? So the mass number is not on the periodic table anywhere. This is the red number, the atomic mass, which is an average based upon the abundance of nature. But because the average comes out closest to the one you have the most of, round the red number to the nearest whole number will give you the most common. I don't know, maybe one, and there's a bunch. Some have three, some have five, you know. Um, so you're going to just find the average, that's the most abundant one. So we don't need any more practice of these, huh? Okay? Now, I did, I kind of got going right off the bat, and I really wanted to uh, look at something like this. Uh, something like this. And this is on page seven, if you want to make a note, page 76 in your textbook. I'm assuming that you guys watched the video yesterday. And at the end of class, especially in sixth period, in sixth period on the second video, um, we went through and did some on the previous paper. They're all neutral. Okay? But if we want to go through in here, what, what does that three plus mean on cobalt three plus? It lost three electrons. Okay? And what is the uh, word for losing electrons, the process of losing electrons? Oxidation. Oxidation. And so gaining electrons is. And again, why can gaining electrons be called reduction? <laughs> because the charge is being reduced. Okay? It kind of seems like a stupid name for something that's gaining electrons to be reduced. But it's the charge that's going down. So, we're going to have a second. But if I look at cobalt 59 3 plus, how many electrons, huh? How many protons is cobalt going to have? What if you don't? We've got a right in the middle of the top, 27. Okay, so it's going to have 27 protons. How many neutrons is it going to have? How did you get that? 59 is protons and neutrons. 27 is protons, so subtract the two, and you get 32. Let me just finish this one. So how many electrons have got 27 protons? How many electrons are going to have? 24. 24. 24. It's got 27 protons. It lost three, so neutral is going to have 27 electrons. It lost three, so it's going to be 24. And its net charge is plus three. Uh, and they're doing that one, I do three plus. Okay, so when we come back and get a break, come back and uh, we'll just fill in the rest of these, make sure you know how to do that. Okay, with ions. Okay, and so you can pause them. So, if I'm looking here, 34 protons, how do I know what element it is? You just look up here and then you assume you always have a periodic table. Okay, now you will never have to memorize these. Okay, now you can if you want to. Okay, but you don't have to memorize them. So I just go look at our table and see that that's selenium. Okay, but I need to put the mass number up top. What's my mass number going to be? Thirty-four. Thirty-four plus forty-six, which is going to be eighty. Okay, eighty. So. It's got 36 electrons, so what's the charge going to be? Minus. Two minus. Okay? Now, let me just tell you the, the slight difference here. If I say minus two, that, oh, we need to start that. Okay. Okay. Um, if I say minus two, that's an oxidation state. That's the number of electrons an atom tends to gain, lose, or share. It's really more oxidation states are more important than covalent bonding when you don't really have a transfer of electrons. Uh, they're more sharing. It just kind of tells us how many electrons are involved in bonding for a particular atom. Okay? 
And we'll talk when we get into bonding. I'll go into that in more detail. But minus sign in front is oxidation state. Minus sign at the behind the number is always going to be the actual charge on the ion. That means the electrons have been transferred. So in ion bonding, the oxidation state and charge are going to be the same. It's covalent bonding when it's a little bit different. So whenever we have an ion, now you never want to lose points for say minus two versus two minus. If you note this chart up here, these are all ions. Therefore, on this chart, this should all be two minus, three minus, okay, two plus, three plus on the chart, but they're wrong. Okay, so you're never going to lose points for putting the sign in the wrong place, but that's the little technical difference between sign in front and sign in the back. Sign in front is oxidation number, sign in the back is the actual charge. Okay? So, 76. You want to find element number 76? Osmium. Osmium. Okay? And we get the, the mass number by adding them together, so it's going to be? 192. 192. We get to do some good mental math. Okay? Now, it's got a 2 plus charge. So it's going to have 74 electrons. Okay, is everybody going to roll up? Is everybody good with that? I mean, I don't need to keep going over and over and over if we all understand it. I mean, this is something you did in chemistry one. Okay, we'll just do the last one. 80 protons, mercury, HG, okay? 200, okay? And then it's got 78 electrons, so it's going to be 2 plus. Okay, all right? So, I'll leave this one for you to do for practice. I mean, I'm not going to sign it, but if you want to do more practice, uh, then you can kind of check with me and make sure you did it right. Um, this one, I should have done this one. This one, the answer is in the back of the book. Um, but if you, you want to just practice that, that, that. So, you should be able to do it for neutral and for um, ions. And if you go backwards, the ones we did in sixth period that you guys probably couldn't see, we did these right here, okay? which is the exact same thing, it's just they're neutral. So what does that mean about protons and electrons every time? They're just going to be the same. So you do the exact same thing, it's just going to be protons equals electrons. Because there's no charge. Okay? So you can you know, practice that if you, you know, if, if you feel like you need to. All right. I don't think I have the PowerPoint pulled back up. Now. All right. So everybody has a good one. Mass spectrometer that measures mass that we're going to use the average mass that tells me my abundance. We're going to use that to calculate that. Okay, I talked about this the other day, so I'm going to go quickly. But whenever you have this, this is called a nuclear symbol. The bottom number is the atomic number. The top number is always going to be the mass number. Okay, so you might see it written as called in dash twelve as well. Where sometimes they don't put this bottom number like we were doing on that chart. We didn't put the bottom number. Because if it's carbon, we know it's got six protons. So it's a little redundant to have to put the six and the C. Because carbon can only have six protons. If it's not six protons, it's not carbon. Okay, so this is optional, the bottom number. Now, the top number is important because you have different mass numbers. Okay? So we need to always just see that. Okay? And then we talked already about isotopes. Uh, I should be able to do this, you know. But that's what we just kind of did with the isotopes, okay? And then we just did our average atomic weight. Now on the periodic table, okay, elements to the left of the zigzag line are what? Metals. Okay, there we go. So everything over here are metals. Everything to the right of the zigzag line, non-metals. And the very right along the zigzag line are metalloids. Okay, which have properties of both. Okay, so that's easy. Now, we call columns, what do we call columns? 
families or groups. Why are they called families? They have similar properties. Just like you are similar to your brothers or your sisters. Okay? Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. You don't want to be like them or you do. But, but you're gonna you know you're gonna resemble them, you're going to uh, pick up speech like that. I, so many times I find myself doing things that my dad did that I said, really, how did I pick that up? I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Okay, so columns are called families or groups. Okay, the rows are called periods or series, but periods is the most one. Okay, because when you get to the end of the row, at the end of the period, the pattern begins repeating itself. Okay, so it's just like a, a periodical in the, in the library. After a week, you get another magazine. After another week, you get another magazine. Or after a month, you get another magazine. After so long of a time, you get the pattern repeats itself. Okay? So that's why the rows are called periods. All right, now we have some names. Oh, this is telling me the names. Okay, that just does tell me the same thing. All right. Um, that's just kind of going through, and we don't need to know that right now. All right, this is what I want you to know. You need to know the names of these families. Okay? Group 1A. Go ahead and point that up over here. Okay? Group 1A. They're known as alkali metals. Now, what's the word alkali mean? You got alkaline batteries. Another word we've heard of a lot, but don't know what it means. Anyone? Alkali. It has to do with its pH. It's basic. Alkaline means basic. These elements make strong bases. When they combine with the OH minus ion, they make strong bases. Group 2A are called alkaline earth metals, still alkaline, so they're still going to make bases. But milk of magnesia is magnesium hydroxide. You take that for an upset stomach too much, it's an antacid. An antacid, when you put ant, that means opposite. Antacid means it's basic. Okay? So, group 1A are alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals. Very little known name for um, group 6A which is really group 16, that we don't use the 6A the designation anymore, so that should be group 16. Got rid of the A and Bs and 995. Okay? Chalcogens, then the halogens are group 17. And halogen means salt former. Chalcogens means chalk. Well, I don't know chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that forms chocolate, or whatever that is in Latin. Okay, and then these are called the group 18 of your noble gases. Why are they called noble gases? They don't have some. You know, might refer to them as the stuck-up gases because they're just too good for everybody else. They don't react with anybody. You know, even not even themselves. Now, helium, neon, argon. There are no known compounds ever to be able to be made with those. Okay. So they float around as single monetary atoms their whole existence. They're just a gas where the atoms are apart and they're just floating around. Okay? Krypton and xenon, and even radon, but radon's radioactive, but krypton and xenon, if you react it with chlorine or fluorine, you can make some compounds, just a few, with the most highly reactive substances. Okay? But those basically don't react with anything either. So the noble gases, another term for them is inert, I-N-E-R-T, inert gases. If you have an inert ingredient, what does that mean? It doesn't react, it doesn't do anything. So if you ever look at uh, like a bug spray or something, it's going to say active ingredient, okay, give you what, you know, the 0.0.1% or whatever um, that reacts. And then you're going to have some inert ingredients that are there as propellant, as preservatives, as other things, but they're not going to do anything to kill the body. They're inert ingredients. 
Um, another much less used name for this group are called the rare gases. Rare, because they're just they're found in the atmosphere, but they're hard to find. Okay, but really, noble gases is the one that you really need to know. Okay, now what do we call them on the inside here, in the, the inside the goalpost? Transition metals. Okay, and these down here, rare earth metals, or sometimes the more modern name is inner, I N N E R, inner transition metals. Because they go right here, they're better inside the transition metals. This is where these two rows fit in. Okay? But rare earth metals, really the top row of your rare earths, but they talk about rare earth metal magnets. Neodymium is a rare earth and it makes a very strong magnet. Okay? So we just need another classification of the periodic table, our elements, and, and we need to know this is your atomic number, the red number is your atomic mass, your average atomic mass based upon the abundance. The mass number is not given anywhere on there. And I'll give you a periodic table probably to some All right, so who's responsible for knowing the names of your families? And by the way, the bottom two rows, this is really going to be hard to remember. So 57, the, the 58 goes right there. This is called the lanthanide series. This whole row, lanthanide series, named after lanthanum, which is right next to it. And your, the periodic table in your book actually has lanthanum down here as the first one. And lutetium is back up in here at 71. And then this is going to be called the actinide series here. The actinide series is right next to actinium. But you, that you probably won't ever have to know, but you may see it referred to as lanthanide or actinide. That's going to be just the bottom two rows, and they're called that because they go right next to those elements. All right, metals on the left, we already talked about that, and the properties of metals, non metals on the right, okay? Um, and they're metalloids. All right, we've even talked about this song, and we don't need to talk about it. A molecular compound, the difference between a molecular element and a molecular compound, okay? So we, we've seen that already, so you don't need to spend time dealing with that. We do need to know your seven diatomic elements. I think I've mentioned this before, but it starts at seven and makes a seven. Anything that ends in gen or ene, G-E-N or I-N-E, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are your seven diatomic. So it's going to be H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. Only though when it's pure. Oxygen can combine in any ratio. Water is H2O. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. Potassium chlorate is HKCO3. Sulfuric acid is H2SO4. So you can have any numbers of oxygens in a compound. But when it's oxygen gas, It's O2. We're breathing in nitrogen gas right now. It's N2. But we're also breathing in some argon. That's just going to be AR. There's not going to be a subscript 2 on it. Only these seven get the subscript 2. Everything else is monotonic. All right, so empirical and molecular formulas. This is what I want to kind of get into. Empirical and molecular formulas. What's an empirical formula? The simplest ratio. It's like a reduced fraction. Whereas a molecular formula actually tells me what the formula of this other compound is, the molecule. I ion compounds use an empirical formula. Because they don't form molecules, so we just get the simplest ratio. Covalent compounds, we use molecular formulas because covalent compounds form molecules. Now, this is kind of coming up later, but I'm just going to say right now, what? How many tell is ionic or covalent compound? Okay, so an ionic is what? Ionic is a metal and a non-metal. She's the first one that I could actually understand. I heard a bunch of them all over there. A metal and a non-metal is ionic. Covalent is going to be two non-metals. So the first thing for ionic is a metal, the second thing is a non-metal. 
With covalent, the first thing's a non-metal, the second thing's a non-metal. So you will get the very first element in your compound. If it's a metal, it's ionic. If it's non-metal, it's covalent. It's that simple. Because the second thing's always a non-metal. The first thing, NaCl. Well, Na is way over here on the left side of the periodic table. It's an alkaline metal, so that means NaCl is ionic. But C6H12O6, the first thing's carbon. That's a non-metal, so I know it's covalent. Okay? Ionic use empirical formulas. Covalent use molecular formulas. So, if I say C6H12O6, is that an empirical or a molecular formula? How do we know? That's true, but how else do we know? It can, it can be simplified and it's not. But this is the way the molecule actually exists. So this is a molecular formula. So what would the empirical formula of this be? CH2O is the empirical formula. Okay? So compounds, covalent compounds, because they form molecules, we better get the, the formula as the molecule exists, whether or not it can, it's in a reduced or non-reduced form. How the molecule exists? Now, water, H2O, well, that's both. It's the simplest ratio, but it's also the way the molecule exists. Okay? Now, there are different ways in which we can represent this. Sometimes we'll see a structural formula. The most common time you're going to see a structural formula is with acetic acid vinegar. Acetic acid is hc 2 h 3 O2. Okay? But we want to kind of know how it has everything put together. So sometimes you'll see it written as CH3COOH. Because if we draw the Lewis dot structure for acetic acid, it looks like this. The hydrogen, this hydrogen is actually attached to that oxygen. So it gives you an, a, a more structure. This kind of tells me what's bonding to what. COOH is going to tell me that one oxygen is here, and then the other oxygen goes to an OH. So COOH is the carboxylic acid group. Okay, so it kind of helps us to know, especially in organic compounds, there's so many different ways they can combine. It kind of helps you to know how they're going to combine. So this is called a structural formula. If you notice up here for the acetate ion, it's given CH3COO minus. Because this is the hydrogen that gets lost and it leaves its electron behind, and so we get the minus charge. So it's written CH3COO, but sometimes you'll see the acetate ion written C2H3O2. That's just the molecular formula. Okay? And then these just use your ball and stick models, and we'll build those and just kind of go from there. But I do want you just to kind of see, especially with acetic acid, you can see it both ways. When you see it, CH3COOH, that's a structural formula that's helping you to know how the atoms are bonded together. All right, we already talked about that ions and cations, common cations, common anions, where you'll get a sheet of that. You will have to memorize a few for the uh, AP test, but we'll use them all year long, and hopefully it'll just become natural, the nitrates, the sulfates, um, the chlorates, the things we use all the time will, will become real popular, real, real easy. Okay, so again, this is total introduction, we've already mentioned it, ionic is a metal and a non-metal, it's just the transfer of electrons, and you've seen this before, that sodium atom has 11, but it loses one and becomes 10. Chlorine gains one, it's 18, this is negative, this is positive, and it's the positive to negative that holds it together. Okay, so I don't know if I really want to go into that. Uh, I don't want to do all the names. 
right now. We'll do that next week. Okay? What I do want to do is talk about percent composition and calculating empirical and molecular formulas. composition of each element by mass in KCLO3. And in, what you think? So we have to get the molar mass of this, okay? So the molar mass, which I'm going to always abbreviate M, M, now on, okay? So the molar mass of KCLO3. How do you calculate that? Add them all up. Now I'm just going to be make go overboard here. But then you look at potassium, and let's get at least two decimal places. So you find potassium is 39.098, so we can say 39.10. Okay. Plus one chlorine, which is 35.45, I believe. It's been a long time. Plus three times oxygen, which is 16.00. So when you do all of that out, it turns out to equal 122.55. Now, the unit on that is either going to be AMUs, one molecule, one or in this case, in, in ionic compounds, if they don't form molecules, we call it a formula unit. But a formula unit is just a fancy, it's, an, it's a um, semantic difference between its molecules. Ionic compounds don't form molecules, so we can't say it's a molecule, so instead we just say formula unit, the mass of one formula. Okay? So 122.5 can be AMUs, but we're going to tend to make it grams per mole because we want the percent by mass, but it won't matter. So what's my percent corn, um, percent potassium going to be? Times 100. Okay, so my percent chlorine. And then my percent oxygen is going to equal 48.00 divided by 122.55 times 100. And somebody get me what the top number equal to? Again, so we have four divided by five, so we get four, 31.91% potassium. The second one, anybody? 28.93% chlorine. Now we could add these up and subtract from 100 to get that, but it's probably easier just to plug in the 48 divided by 122.55. Thirty-nine point one six seven, so one seven percent oxygen. Now, if you know that this is going to come out to one zero, so it's really going to come out to one hundred point zero one total percent. That's just due to rounding, right? Okay? Because we're rounding off. But 
we can get the percentage of each thing just by defining the molar mass. Everybody remember how to do the molar mass? Do I need to go over that anymore with anybody? Okay, so we're all good with molar mass. Okay, adding up, just using the red numbers, you will always have a periodic table. You will never have to memorize uh, uh, you know, atomic masses. You have a periodic table on every problem that you'll ever do. Okay, now. Let's take this a little bit more to application. All right, can we just put them like this? We're all done. There we go. How many grams of carbon? RN carbon. RN. What's the normal uh, aspirin? Or what's the milligram? Is that the 100 milligram tablet? Is that anybody? Who do you ask? I know the ibuprofen is 200 milligrams. We'll say 100 milligram tablet of aspirin. C nine H eight O four. What do you think we need to do with this? Find the percent composition of carbon, and then do what with that? Multiply it by the one milligram, right? So we could do this, and so we can say the molar mass C nine H eight. 04 is equal to 9 times 12.01 plus 8 times 1.01 plus 4 times 16.00. And now all these numbers are coming off the periodic table. I just have to be a nerd and know what they are. Okay? I've also done it for a very, 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 very long time. But the bread is beginning to hold, so I'm starting to forget some of them. So. Alright, so we end up getting. 12 times 9 is equal to 108.09 plus 8.08 .08 plus 64. So that's going to equal uh, 116, 180.17 grams per mole. Okay? That's not mental math, y'all. Just add things up in your head without using a calculator. We're going to work on that some this year. So how do I get the percent carbon? What did you say? I said the carbon The 108.09 divided by the 180.17. And that's going to get me 59.99. 59 59.99 percent carbon. And then what do I need to do with that? Multiply that times 100. So I'm going to move the decimal place back to 0 0.5999 times 100 milligrams. And it's going to turn out to equal 0. Point, uh, uh, what's it going to come out to? 100 59. 59. 59. 59.99. Uh, it's true because we have 100 milligrams, so we'd say 60.0. So 60% basically is going to be there. Now notice what we did though is that we multiplied by 100 to put it in the percent, and then the first thing we had to do is divide by 100 to take it out of the percent. So you can really combine this and just end up saying 180. 108.09 over 180 times 100 milligrams. Because this is really your, your percent composition right here. So you don't have to go and do it in two steps. You can just go ahead and this divided by this, the decimal form of your percent, just times whatever sample you have to find the grams of each thing in a sample. 
Okay? So, let me just see you guys do this one. Just do this in your notes. matches what's on the board. It's both but they, they change it up a little bit. Um, these, when they didn't put holes, they used a hole punch, but if you need a hole punch, you have to put it in your um, notebook, you can use the hole punch up here.
from percent composition data. Okay? Now, there are going to be three steps to find the empirical formula, and then three more to find the molecular formula. There are simple steps. The first step is going to be convert percent or two grams. Because we're assuming a 100 gram sample. The law of depth and composition says that no matter how much of the substance you have, it's going to have the same composition by mass. So if you use 25 grams, 50 grams, 100 grams, it's going to have all the exact same percent composition. If we use a 100 gram sample, well then the percent is going to be that many grams. You know, so 50% of 100 is 50 grams. Okay? So we're going to just make, so in other words, you just kind of do that in your head. Now I'm going to, I'm going to get you this worksheet. Uh, well, I want you to go to. In my own, and this slide shows so I'm getting good. Here. So if I come over here and look at question number 88, right? It says acetic acid is an important ingredient in vinegar. It's composed of 40% carbon, 6.71 hydrogen, and 53.29 oxygen. Its molar mass is 60. Determine the empirical and molecular formula of the acid. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the percents to grams. So I'm going to say that I have 40 grams of carbon. I have 6.71 grams of hydrogen. And I have 53.29 grams of oxygen. Okay? But when I say a formula of sugar, C6H12O6, are those 6 grams of carbon, 12 grams of hydrogen, and 6 grams of oxygen? The number of atoms, right? Or the moles of atoms. So everything that we do is going to be in terms of numbers, not mass. So I'm going to, to determine the formula. So we need to figure out how many moles of atoms each one of these are. So number two is convert grams of each element of each element to moles. Okay? So how do I do that with carbon? How do I convert to moles? Over 12.01 grams, right? One mole over 1.01 gram. One mole, 16.00 grams. Okay, so let's give you some numbers here on this. This is going to be 36. 3.33. And I strongly recommend you go ahead and do the moles of carbon so you know what you found. Use your units. 6.71, does that come out to 6.68, 6.67, something like that? 6.64. And then the last one. kind of see, but the law of definite composition says if this is a compound, the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are in a small whole number ratio. Okay? So we need to figure out now, we have a whole ratio, but we need a whole number ratio. So to get the whole number ratio, you divide by the smallest one. The smallest one becomes one, and everything else should be a multiple of that. So we're going to divide 
by 3.33 divided by 3.33 divided by 3.33. So we end up getting 1, 2, 1. Now notice that this doesn't come out exactly to 2. It's going to come out to 1.98 somewhere. But as long as you're within 0.05, it's okay. Now, if you're way off when you divide, then if it's like 0.5, we have to do something else. Okay, so this is my empirical formula. It's going to be what? CH2O. This is my empirical formula. Okay? So our third step is divide each mole value by the smallest mole value to get a small whole number ratio. I don't know if you guys can see this online, but listen to what I'm saying. Divide each mole, each mole value by the smallest mole value to get a small whole number ratio. That's what we did right here. So that's my empirical formula. Now, it tells me in the problem that the molecular formula is 60. You have to know the molecular, the molecular mass. The molecular mass is 60. So the molar mass is given as 60 grams per mole. This is given. So how do I go then to find the molecular mass? If I have my empirical formula is this, and I know the molecular mass is 60, what do I do? Okay, so number four is calculate the mass of the empirical formula. Now I'm going to abbreviate that EFM. Empirical formula mass. Okay? So we can just do that. The EFM CH2O is equal to 12.01 plus 1 times 1.01 plus 16.00 is equal to uh, probably 2 times 1.01. So it comes out to 12.2830. 0, 0.3 grams per mole. So what does that mean? It's half of what the molecular is, right? So we need to double it. But to get that ratio, sometimes it's not as intuitively obvious. So the simple step is divide the given molar mass by the EFM to get a small whole number. Okay, so we're going to go 60 divided by 30 is going to equal 2. So that means you then multiply the empirical formula by the whole number. So we're going to go times 2, so it's going to end up being 2 times CH2O. Now, you've got to do subscripts, so it's going to be C2H4O2. Now, the way we would normally write that again, this is H4, they combined everything, it doesn't know. The real formula is going to be HC2H3O2. 
is that H is going to be separate. It's, yeah, every compound's got a positive thing, every compound's got a negative thing. Hydrogen's the positive, the acetate ion's the negative thing. Three steps to find empirical formula. Three more easy steps to find the molecular formula. Now, in order to be able to find the molecular formula, you have to know the molecular mass. If you don't know this, you can only go to here. Okay? Ooh. I was hoping you didn't have time to practice one. Yeah, is that what I call that coming down? That one's. Um, I don't think you're going to have time, and it is Friday, um, but we'll come in on Monday, we're going to work on this. Normally we would have done a lab right now, so I'm just trying to figure out how I want to make that work. Um, With small numbers, that would be two days. I'm going to ask the commission to see it, because by the time you guys go in, I can pick everything up, put out new features and things, and spray whatever I need to spray for the next class coming in. Really want to make it in the house.